it is time for another one of the greatest stories never told. Despite his unceremonious exit from the industry in 1962, Bernard Kriegstein remains as relevant today as he was in his prime some 70 years ago, maybe even more so. Over the past few years, Kriegstein has finally begun to earn a modicum of the respect due to him and his innumerable contributions to the comic book medium. Much of Kriegstein's prominence is due to a lasting interest in the EC publications, which has continued since their creation in the 1950s, influencing generation after generation of writers and artists to come. But Kriegstein is most certainly a special case in many regards. His most famous story, Master Race, while widely unknown by many comics fans, fetched an astounding $600,000 at a heritage auction in 2018. Those are the kind of numbers usually reserved for the most iconic pieces of original art. But as I said, a lot of people have never even heard of Master Race. So what makes it so special? Published in 1955 for the inaugural issue of EC's final comic book series, Impact, Master Race is widely considered a hallmark in comics and without a doubt one of the most influential stories ever created, drastically altering what many people even thought could be achieved in the medium of comic books. However, Master Race remains the only Bernard Kriegstein story that many comic book readers are familiar with and that is a low down dirty shame. Kriegstein enjoyed success on virtually every type of comic book that he ever worked on, and he worked on them all. Kriegstein was ingeniously versatile when it came to every facet of drawing a comic book and made innumerable contributions to the medium during his all too brief time in the field. As the rest of the world finally catches up to what many of your favorite artists have known for a long time, more and more people are discovering that there's a lot more to Bernard Kriegstein than just one single story. And tonight, I want to talk about the genius of one of the most celebrated and yet equally obscure comic book creators of all time, and the real reasons that you've never heard of Bernard Kriegstein. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. And if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the links in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page, make a donation via Ko-Fi, pick up a shirt, or use the join button to sign up for membership here on YouTube. I also personally want to thank longtime viewer and a guy I'm proud to call a friend, Tom Nordley, for help with this video. He spent hours helping me research and edit this information, and it would not have been possible without him. But now, let's get into it. Bernard Kriegstein probably isn't a name that you've heard before unless you're really into EC Comics or happen to catch one of the numerous YouTube videos out there about him. If you said his name to your favorite comic book artist though, chances are their faces would light up. Bernard Kriegstein is an artist's artist, a man who saw an unlimited amount of potential in the comics field and spent his entire career attempting to expand the horizons of what people thought was possible with the medium, all the while refining finding his own unique brand of visual storytelling, which in itself was a radical new evolution of the medium that would come to influence generation after generation of artists to follow. In fact, Bernard Kriegstein is unarguably one of the most singularly influential comic book artists of all time. When Art Spiegelman talks about the comics that made him and Mouse possible, Master Race and Bernard Kriegstein are always the first things out of his mouth. Frank Miller has repeatedly stated in interviews about his three-page sequence portraying the murder of Bruce Wayne's parents from The Dark Knight Returns that he wasn't just inspired by Bernard Kriegstein, 
but that Krigstein had literally done it first and that Frank Miller had simply lifted the idea. The death scene would, of course, go on to be immortalized in the 1989 Tim Burton Batman film and has since come to be regarded as perhaps the definitive portrayal of the Wayne's murder. The gravitas of the entire sequence hinges on Bernard Craigstein's trademark manipulation of time and silent narrative panels which Miller used to brilliant effect. I could go on and on, but my point is Craigstein is so often the artist behind your favorite artist. It's nearly impossible to comprehend why he is not more widely known or discussed. The revolutionary approach he took to comic books changed the way that they would be written and drawn forever, and his talent and influence still resonate even beyond the walls of the comic book industry almost a century later. But if all of that is true, if Bernard Kriegstein really is that good, why don't we hear more about him? If his storytelling is so masterful and his art so unique, how has he never managed to rise above industry cult level status? Rest assured, I happen to believe there's a number of reasons, all of which I'll be sharing here with you tonight. However, perhaps the most relevant and pertinent of these reasons would be Bernard Craigstein himself, as perfectly espoused by his nickname. BB. It's a name that often was featured in his cover signatures over the years, and you might be asking yourself, what's the relevance of the nickname BB? Well, BB was short for Ball Buster earning the moniker Wall and the Armed Forces for his staunch and regimented personality, Kriegstein stood out as rigid and regimented even among the most clean cut of military men, apparently approaching every facet of his life with the tenacious energy and meticulous attention to detail that he did his art. Well, maybe not as zealous about his art in the beginning, by all accounts, Bernard Kriegstein was always painfully serious about his craft, but began to border on obsessiveness following an especially difficult period in his life, which ironically would spur on some of his most radical and important contributions to the medium, and some of the most important ever made. In a time when most artists were churning out as much work as they possibly could to secure as large a paycheck as possible, many of Craigstein's peers, too embarrassed to admit that they even worked in comics when asked, could not wrap their heads around why he got so worked up about stories for the so-called funny books they were working on. Craigstein in juxtaposition appears to have wondered why everyone around him appeared so utterly incapable of grasping the amazing possibilities that comic books represented for storytelling. He believed the medium of comics was capable of so much more than what he had perceived as the mediocre successes it was achieving in the 1940s and 50s, a demanding and almost impossible to please man despite creating some of the greatest comics to have ever been printed, as well as making innumerable contributions to the craft, in doing so, Craigstein would never be truly satisfied with his work, or much of anyone else's for that matter, a fact which he unfortunately made no secret of and did not help to endear him to other industry professionals who already viewed him as an eccentric, radical artist to begin with. Craigstein never seemed to play well with others, so to speak, and spent his entire career hopelessly enamored with the endless possibilities of his chosen profession, while at the same time shackled by an almost complete inability to act on his superior artistic instincts in the vast majority of his work due to editorial interference. A visionary talent of immense proportions, dwarfing even the awesome skills of his contemporaries, many of whom are considered to be among the greatest artists to have ever graced the medium, Craigstein would be rebuffed and ignored by both editors and publishers until finally leaving the industry altogether in complete disillusionment after years of struggling against a system that seemed dead set on stopping him and his dangerous notion of comic books as a serious art form out of existence. While there are 
painfully few interviews conducted with Craigstein, the most important and only complete surviving published interview that I'm aware of was conducted on August 16th of 1962 for the monograph publication Bob Stewart and John Benson Talk with B. Craigstein, published the following year in 1963. Thankfully, both Benson and Stewart are intelligent and astute individuals, and the 1962 interview covers a lot of really important material that would have probably otherwise been lost to time. In fact, not only is this an illuminating interview, but many comic historians consider it to be the first real in-depth interview with a comic book professional ever conducted. Following its original release in 1963 and 1975, the Stuart Benson interview would become the basis for issue 6 of the semi-professionally produced fanzine Squatron. According to the notes in that issue, Squatron obtained original tapes or direct copies of them and reviewed the Bob Stewart John Benson interview from 1962, correcting errors made in the original transcription as well as including previously excised material not featured in the original published monograph version. Along with the original 1962 Stuart Benson interview, there are interspersed thoughts and addenda from Craigstein that discuss changes of heart and opinion which he'd had in the intervening 13 years between the original 1962 monograph interview and the publication of the 1975 issue 6 of the Squatron fanzine. These additional thoughts are apparently taken from the aptly titled B. Craigstein interview, which appeared in issue 5 of a publication titled Chameleon. The B. Craigstein Chameleon interview was conducted by a man named Eric Heinemann, as indicated by the notes in Squatron 6, and while Squatron reprints selected paragraphs from this interview, for some unknown reason, it is not presented in its entirety. I was never able to find any information about Chameleon, let alone a copy of the interview, unfortunately. If you know anything, please get in the comments section and sound off, because I couldn't even find a single image of Chameleon itself out there. The majority of the other interviews that I know of with Bernard Craigstein were all conducted by John Benson over a number of intervening years following the 1962 interview for the Monograph publication. From my understanding, the two got along really well and continued to correspond and talk about Craigstein's comic career until at least 1987, only three years before Craigstein's unfortunate passing. This is of a special note as the 2013 Fanographics publication, Messages in a Bottle, comic book stories by B. Craigstein, is supplemented with excerpts from one of these further correspondence. In that particular case, an interview with Bernard Craigstein and his wife conducted sometime in 1987. Mysteriously, again, however, Messages in a Bottle only chooses to use sparse supplements from this piece. I really wish it had been presented in its unedited form, as it was never published anywhere else to the best of my knowledge, but it does add to the building narrative of the information as laid out in the original 1962 Stuart Benson interview, which having already been the basis of two prior publications, would become the centerpiece for the biographical section of Fanographics Messages in a Bottle as well. Interestingly, there are differences in all three of the printed versions of the 1962 Stuart Benson interview. The major difference, which was pointed out to me by my partner in crime on this video, Tom Nordley, was a quote concerning one Stanley Lieber, better known today as Stan Lee. Originally, a shorter, perhaps abridged version of the Lee quote appears in the supposedly extended Squatron interview, followed by its inclusion in Messages in a Bottle with additional content. This extended version of the quote is the one most commonly found online, though I suspect this is only because Messages in a Bottle is a much more contemporary release and a lot easier to get your hands on. Tom and I were unfortunately unable to track down a copy of the original monograph publication of the interview for cross-reference, and therefore unable to ascertain exactly when the quote changed. However, this does indicate that at one point or another, there was either intentional censoring of the rather inflammatory remarks made about Lee, or the supposedly expanded secondary transcription presented in Squatron 6, meant to correct mistakes made originally, was itself also incorrect.
While it is possible that Kriegstein expanded on his original thought and quote directly by correspondence with John Benson, as noted above during their years of lengthy interaction and correspondences, this seems highly unlikely. It's not a major discrepancy, I guess, but I did find it interesting enough as this interview is the primary source of information, not only for this video, but in general about Bernard Kriegstein, I did think it was worth mentioning. Thankfully, in large part due to a few biographical pieces, but mostly the 1962 Stuart Benson interview, we know that Craig Stein's primary interest in comic books stemmed from his belief that they filled a gap created by the modernist and abstract art forms which were prevalent at the time he entered the industry in 1941. Both modernist and abstract art attempted to divorce themselves almost entirely from actual subject matter, while comics are representations art depicting easily recognizable visual stories for an extremely wide range of readers. The more he discovered about the possibilities of comics, the more Kriegstein became obsessed with filling this lack of subject matter in popular art with what he perceived as its antithesis, the unique visual storytelling of comic books. Bernard Kriegstein meticulously dissected every possible aspect of his chosen profession and came to some revolutionary conclusions extremely early on. Perhaps most interesting to me, he postulated that in many cases, the space between the panels was actually more important than anything on the page. He believed that this space, the emptiness that lay outside and in between panels, was where the most important part of enjoying art actually occurred. This void of visual information was the point where the reader was forced to interact with the subject matter the most. The writer and the artist were no longer in command of what the reader was thinking, and in essence, the reader became a willing participant in the actual storytelling process. Kriegstein was convinced that this was one of the most important and integral parts of the craft, and he took it into increasing consideration with his compositions as time passed. Interestingly enough, I was listening to a shoot interview with X-Men scribe and living legend Chris Claremont not long ago on the cartoonist Kayfabe channel, link in the description below. And Chris Claremont described almost exactly the same thing, but he called it the white space. Claremont went on to talk about how they could only show so much in a panel or on a page or even in an entire comic book. But in between the panels, in those white spaces, in that white space, that was where the characters really lived and breathed, separated by decades. Claremont was considered revolutionary in his storytelling approach when he helped launch the redesigned X-Men in the 1970s and went on to helm almost the entire X-Universe for more than two decades. And he was hitting on an idea that Kriegstein had not only put forward almost 30 years prior, but one that Kriegstein had basically been ostracized and ridiculed for. This is not to mention Bernard Kriegstein never wrote a single comic book in his entire career, nor did he want to. He was simply a master of his craft and examined comic books from every possible angle. I think this kind of brilliant insight into his craft perfectly spotlights the unrequited genius of Bernard Kriegstein and his love-hate relationship with comic books. Ahead of his time and largely misunderstood, this was unfortunately often the case for Kriegstein. Despite being introduced to comics simply as an easy way to make a good living, capitalizing on his background and education in fine art, Kriegstein fell in love with the medium and spent decades toiling in relative obscurity. What started as an easy way to make a quick buck quickly grew into what many would describe as an obsession and one that would very nearly consume Kriegstein. Convinced of the superior storytelling capabilities offered by comic books, Kriegstein spent decades trying to convince publishers to allow him to adapt works like War and Peace and Fahrenheit 451 into a graphic novel format the likes of which has never been seen. Increasingly enthralled by an artistic vision no one else 
mortals could seem to fathom, Kriegstein conceptualized and pushed for hundreds and in some cases thousands of pages of sequential art to tell adaptations of complex stories in ways which you could not achieve in any other medium. Kriegstein yearned for someone to allow him to utilize what he perceived as the full potential of comic books, fueled by an almost inexhaustible energy in his search for perfection. He was bursting at the seams with ideas, and so am I. That's enough of an introduction of the man, so let's really get into it now, shall we? For a man who would become so deadly serious about his craft and obsessed with the wonders of the medium, interestingly, Bernard Kriegstein was completely uninterested in comics prior to entering the field in 1941. Leading up to the U.S. entering the Second World War, many formerly trained artists found themselves out of work and virtually unemployable. Kriegstein was one of these unlucky individuals. He found work several years prior as a teacher with the Federal Art Project, a division of the Works Progress Administration, which had been part of the New Deal agencies created by President Roosevelt in 1935. But by 1941, the Federal Art Project was going to lose their funding, and as the U.S. entered the war, Kriegstein knew it was only a matter of time before he was drafted to serve. Having only been sporadically employed for a decent stretch of time, Kriegstein was in dire need of money to leave for his wife before he inevitably shipped out overseas when his cousin Esther Rubinstein made a suggestion. Rubenstein's then-husband, Jerry Gale, was working for a man named Bernard Bailey, and apparently Esther rather frequently talked about what she considered the ridiculous amount of money that her husband, Jerry Gale, was making working on comic books. While he had never really given comic books a second thought, and by his own admission was almost completely uninterested in them, Kriegstein decided to take Rubenstein up on her offer to make some introductions. Given that he had been teaching art for several years and the fact that he had a formal background in the fine arts and in illustration as well, Rubenstein was quickly able to convince Jerry Gale to set up a meeting between Bernard Kriegstein and Bernard Bailey. For those that aren't totally up on your golden age history, Bernard Bailey is not only the creator of the original Spectre, as well as our man for DC Comics, but he even contributed a story and a character, Tex Thompson, for the comic that debuted Superman Action Comics number one in 1938. Tex Thompson would later evolve into America Mando and also go by the name Mr. America and a few other monikers appearing in the first 74 issues or so of Action Comics. Bailey's creation, The Spectre, had been prominently featured for almost two years in another of DC's biggest books, The Justice Society of America, by the time Kriegstein was introduced to the prominent and prolific artist who was also operating a successful art studio on 43rd Street in New York. While only two short years later, Bailey would go on to form his own packaging studio venture as well as try his hand at a few different syndicated strips, both of which would prove to be short-lived, disastrous, undertakings. When Kriegstein came looking for employment, Bailey was putting out a plethora of work for a vast number of different publishers and had an abundance of work to go around. Reportedly, after showing Bernard Bailey his portfolio, Kriegstein was hired on the spot and put to work almost immediately. Initially given ancillary jobs, as was the custom for almost everyone entering the field, even those with prior art experience, Kriegstein began by erasing pencils, filling in blacks, and inking backgrounds. But by 1942, only a few months later, Kriegstein had quickly graduated to pencil and ink work. Kriegstein was instantly smitten and his life would never be the same, and neither would the comic book industry. Bernard Kriegstein's first real work most likely comes in the form of an inking job for the December 1942 issue 17 of Blue Beetle. Holyoke still owned the Blue Beetle at that point and were heavily involved with Bernard Bailey, so although this work on Blue Beetle is both unsigned and uncredited, it is widely considered to be Kriegstein's 
first official comic book work. Regardless, Krigstein definitely worked on Champ Comics 25, released in April 1943, as well as two others, All New Short Story Comics number three and Hello Pal Comics number three, both for Harvey Comics and sharing the cover date of May 1943. A voracious learner and hungry to succeed, Krigstein managed to complete seven more stories, mostly for the same publisher, Prize Comics, before November 1943. While still with Bailey, he was allowed to tackle nearly every facet of making a comic book, from penciling and inking to coloring, and even took to what others thought was the strange habit of overseeing the construction and production of the books as closely as he could. The eager Kriegstein took it all in, soaking the knowledge up like a sponge. In 1943, Bernard Bailey started his own publishing venture, Bailey Publications, as well as the Bernard Bailey Studio, which was a packaging studio for other publishers. Though largely forgotten today, when Bailey started it, the lineup was insane. In 1943, you had Bernard Kriegstein, Gil Kane, Carmine Infantino, and John Junta, who I've talked about before. You might also remember me mentioning John Junta's assistant, Frank Rosetta, who in 1943, at the ripe age of 15, was also doing ancillary background work and other odd jobs at Bailey Studio. If you want to learn more about John Junta and Frank Rosetta during this period, check out the little banner or whatever that should be popping up around here somewhere. While he might not have been making the money that his cousin-in-law, Jerry Gale, was, Krigstein was learning an immense amount and had been bitten by the comic book bug. His output was on a steady uptick, but unfortunately for Bernard Krigstein, the armed forces were calling and he was forced to take an unwanted break from his work in comic books to serve in World War II in the fall of 1943. While in the army, Kriegstein might have forgotten about comics. He was, after all, overseas and away from the bustling streets of New York and its legendary newsstands. Overseas and in foreign lands, American comic books should have been a rarity. Instead, he was surrounded by them. Circulation of comics among US GIs overseas was immense during the Second World War, with the overall circulation of comics undoubtedly doubling between 1941 and 1945, with some sources claiming as much as them tripling. While exact numbers are likely impossible to discover today, they had become so widely circulated that the armed forces had themselves begun to produce comic books usually as a sort of teaching aid to warn troops about the dangers of venereal diseases or train GIs on a host of various different tasks. Comics also proved an incredibly effective way of disseminating propaganda to the troops and their families back home as well. Comics were being both weaponized and used as teaching tools simultaneously by the very same people. World War II was an extremely important time for comic books, as a perceived audience for them began to completely shift as well. What had originally been conceived of and even marketed as children's funny books were being found more and more commonly in the hands of GIs and other adults seeking an escape. As sales for both so-called true life and superhero comic books continued to grow, European retailers began to make sure to keep copious amounts of American comic books in stock to sell to American GIs who were passing through. When it was discovered that most men preferred the more lurid material usually found in the pulp publications of the day, there was a dramatic shift in a great deal of the writing being done for comic books. Krigstein was likely exposed to as many, if not more, comic books of all different types and varieties while in the army than is when he was working in the industry. It was during this time he would discover the work of Jack the King Kirby, still working with his longtime partner in crime, Joe Simon, at what was probably the height of his career, aside from the Marvel age for me. Kriegstein fell in love with the work of Simon and Kirby, their exciting and inventive visual lexicon, further inciting the young Kriegstein's interest in the medium and bolstering his increasingly ardent belief that comic book artists hadn't even begun to scratch the surface of the infinite visual storytelling possibilities of the medium.
While his preoccupation with comics grew, he was busy earning the name Ball Buster during this time in the military, hinting at a fairly conservative approach to things to say the least. It's likely this level of staunch rigidity which earned him his nickname is the reason Kriegstein's intense interest in Kirby was so surprising when I first learned of it. The explosive action of Kirby's work was something truly new and different though. Jack Kirby's raw energy and increasingly eccentric approach to human anatomy both caught Kriegstein's eye and ignited a passion in him that would take the better part of the next two decades to stomp out. Bernard Kriegstein only ever truly complimented a few people in the industry that I'm aware of without caveat. Jack Kirby, Joe Simon, Mort Meskin, Mary Severin, and Steve Ditko were among those lucky few. Ditko's sometimes stiff and rigidly, if highly structured and intellectual work, I could understand. A fact DC legend and epic curmudgeon Robert Koeniger did not fail to observe himself. But impressively, Kriegstein was just as able to appreciate the sometimes almost absurd dynamism of Jack Kirby's illustration style, especially during this era with Joe Simon. If you look at Kriegstein and Kirby's pages, it's not hard to imagine him spending his downtime studying and dissecting the impossibly fantastic anatomy and raw energy of Jack Kirby's illustrations, while simultaneously entwining this with his already deep knowledge of the so-called fine arts. After World War II interrupted his career in 1943, Kriegstein returned home and to his beloved comics in 1945. In fact, according to Kriegstein, he got back into comics the day he arrived in New York. Apparently still incredibly enamored with the possibilities of the medium, Kriegstein claims he marched straight from the airport to Bernard Bailey's studio and secured work with them. I found this hard to believe, but he didn't get out of the army until October of 1945, and the first work he worked on following his return was The Treasure Keeper, Accursed Diamonds, published in Treasure Comics number 5, cover date February 1946, but there was another story for Zoo Funnies number 3, Coyote Family Hunts Prairie Dogs, which actually beat Accursed Diamonds to newsstands with a cover date of January 1946, with two published stories within four months of his return, considering print times and the length it would have taken him to actually make the art, it turns out Kriegstein probably wasn't embellishing much, if at all. This period at Bernard Bailey's studio would be a big turning point in Kriegstein's career, as he received praise for his work on Accursed Diamonds from fellow Bailey staffer Charles Voigt, who is something of a Golden Age cartooning legend. Voigt is probably best remembered for his strips Petey Dinky, The Optimist, and Betty in particular, which was an early and important influence on Kriegstein's exquisite line work. Having admired Voigt's work greatly, Kriegstein was kind of taken aback by this attention for work which he really wasn't very proud of. I think feeling like he kind of owed it to Voigt to live up to the compliments paid to him, Kriegstein redoubled his efforts, pushing his artistic capabilities farther than ever before and paying even closer attention to the material which he was producing. He had been examining the quality of how his lines were being reproduced and had been constantly unhappy with them before, but said nothing. Following Voigt's comments, however, he grew increasingly more vigilant and vocal about his line work and how it appeared in print. He also trained himself to be incomparably versatile, capable of working on any genre or style asked of him, using his time with Bailey to refine and tighten his skill set. He discovered how a comic book needed to be constructed and laid out, as well as determine the most efficient usage of space, art, and dialogue to elicit the desired effects. While he was doing all of this, Kriegstein remained with Bernard Bailey for the better part of 1946, producing several stories for Treasure Comics by Prize Publications. Despite the fact that he was learning a lot and that the pay was decent, this Treasure Comics work is likely the reason that Kriegstein remained with Bailey for as long as he did before finally becoming a freelancer for the rest of his entire career around the middle of 1947. 
Among the other contributors to Pride's publications at this time were Mort Meskin, Joe Simon, and Jack Kirby. Meskin, Simon, and Kirby especially were among the very few other industry professionals that Kriegstein seems to have really admired and respected. Though they still showed little hint of the genius that was to come, it was the participation of these men that likely inspired the much more intense and contemplative approach that Kriegstein took to the prize stories when compared to his earlier work. Just as he began to grow more serious about his career and stories, in May of 1946, Kriegstein's wife, Natalie, suffered complications from a pregnancy, and his son was born with life-threatening health conditions, the nature of which I was unable to discover. Bernard Kriegstein was kind of known as something of a paycheck hound, bouncing from one publisher to the next in search of the best pay rates for his entire career, and I think that while he was always looking for good pay, the monetary strain around this time is what actually led him to be so obsessed about pay rates for the rest of his career. As medical bills started piling up, Kriegstein tackled more and more work from a number of publishers to keep up with the growing expenses, and he didn't much care who he was working for or what he was working on. Kriegstein would spend the next six years drawing for anyone that would hire him, including National, Atlas, and MLJ Comics, who would respectively become DC, Marvel, and Archie Comics, just to name a few. While Kriegstein had also attempted to maintain his fine art career alongside his comic book illustration work to this point, doing sporadic paintings and remaining peripherally involved in the fine art scene, over the next two years or so, Kriegstein would essentially cease painting or in fact pursuing virtually any other form of artistic employment, all but abandoning the fine arts world. During this period, rather than paint, he produced what Kriegstein himself referred to simply as quote unquote hack work. This work was mostly done for Fawcett on the characters Golden Arrow and Nyoka the Jungle Girl, where he perfected his craft on hundreds of pages of solid, if somewhat unremarkable work that still offered little glimmer of what would emerge from his work only a short time later. In recalling his time on Golden Arrow and Nyoka, Kriegstein said, quote, These were 32-page books appearing monthly. I believe I handled the chore almost single-handedly, including the covers. I never signed them. They were hack work of the purest distillation, but they were fun and helped me learn my trade. While Kriegstein may recall things this way, after the death of his 16-month-old son in 1947, Kriegstein reportedly threw himself into his work with more conviction than ever before. It was directly following this event that Kriegstein grew increasingly more and more fervent about the quality of his comic book output, the meticulous pacing, and the visual storytelling aspects that would become his signatures slowly beginning to evolve and emerge. A classically trained artist who had made a living for several years as a teacher, Kriegstein began to adopt and adapt techniques and ideas from any and all types of art and artists that he possibly could. Employing these influences, Kriegstein began to invent a bevy of new and intriguing visual elements which had never been seen in comic books before. An easily recognizable style, something synonymous with success during this period, was however not one of them. One thing that is extremely interesting when examining Kriegstein's work as a whole is his rather ubiquitous lack of a defined style. While there are defining characteristics that a trained eye can begin to easily identify once they know what they're looking for, Kriegstein was something of a chameleon, his style fluidly changing and adapting to what he wanted to achieve with the story. This is very much unlike almost any of his contemporaries, especially those who managed to achieve any sort of real success or accolades, most of whom lay claim to a unique or perfected style or subject matter. Bernard Kriegstein, on the other hand, was beyond such things. He had no use for fame or notoriety. He only wanted freedom to do what he wanted. This, unfortunately, would perhaps be the one thing that would continue to elude Kriegstein for the rest of his entire career. He seemed to be driven, and as I mentioned, almost 
at points consumed by some sort of ardent need to make comic books better by any means necessary following his son's death. As his unique eye and approach continued to evolve, Kriegstein's radically different style of storytelling and excruciatingly diverse visual repertoire would prove to be as much of a hindrance as any kind of help, and it would remain this way until he left the industry in disgust and disgrace less than 20 years later. People seemed either incapable of comprehending what Kriegstein was trying to do, or coldly ambivalent about his nonsensical notion that comic books could become real art, and even socially relevant given the proper subject matter and circumstances. Because of this, as well as his rather abrasive personality, Kriegstein faced a myriad of problems getting what he envisioned, and in many cases, even what he drew onto the printed page. Kriegstein was almost always dismayed by the inking done over his pencils, and this would become an increasing source of tension between Kriegstein and his editors and publishers as time progressed. While he was occasionally allowed to ink his own work, which helped immensely, Kriegstein was still less than impressed with the printed results of his work in many cases. In those days, the printing of comic books was anything but accurate. The color and line registration was often wildly misaligned, making the overall image look sloppy and blurred, and even the overall quality of the reproduction of the lines from the original art left a lot to be desired. The lines were often too thick and bled together into black masses on the page, destroying the meticulously created details of the original art, which were drawn in ridiculously huge sizes, the most common of which was commonly referred to as double up. Double up pages are about 12 and a half by 18 and a half inches, which is roughly twice the size of the printed page of Golden Age comics. Art was drawn at this size so artists could include small detail more easily and allow artists to employ a vast number of instruments to ink and paint more freely. Pages were then photographed and shrunk down to roughly 50% of their original sizes for the finished comics. Most artists at the time didn't really care about this transition from the meticulously crafted original art to lackluster printing jobs, which absolutely mutilated work in some cases. Jack Kirby, the unmitigated king of comic books and co-creator of the Marvel Age, has famously said that he never even bothered to read a finished printed Marvel comic that he worked on. While appalling to some people, Kirby was far from alone in his disassociation with the final product of his work. Bernard Kriegstein, however, was far from being disassociated with his work at any step of its creation, production, or presentation. When Kriegstein resumed work after World War II in 1946, over the next two years he worked primarily for Fawcett. As I mentioned, Kriegstein was never proud of this work, referring to it derogatorily for the rest of his life, but also noting that it was the period in which he began to refine his storytelling approach and learn the fundamentals of making a truly effective comic book. In 1948, he did his first work for DC, which would ultimately prove to be an extremely short-lived tenure, due in large part, I believe, to a man named Robert Kaniger. Kriegstein would only produce four stories that I know of for DC during this period, and apparently Kriegstein's relationship with DC was rocky even from the start. Robert Kaniger, who was somewhat of a big deal at DC, hated Bernard Kriegstein for a number of reasons, but somehow the two kept ending up working with one another. I don't know that this is the reason he only did four stories for DC at this point, but I suspect it was the reason, especially considering what happened when they were disastrously teamed together again at DC some four years later. Whatever the reasons, Kriegstein would stop working for DC for a number of years, working primarily for Hillman and Prize throughout 1949, which is coincidentally the same time his wife Natalie did her first work for DC. Now, I've never been able to find many details about her work in the industry, but Natalie Kriegstein is credited with having scripted at least 45 stories, with more than 20 of those writing credits being for DC, until her work for them would abruptly cease in 1952, save for a single story published almost three years later in December of 1954. 
While there are virtually no details about her career, I believe I know why she entered the field and why her relationship with DC was so unceremoniously cut short in 1954, and we'll be discussing it in detail as we move forward. In the end, the fact his relationship with a much larger DC was a short-lived one might have been for the best as Kriegstein transitioned from there to Hillman late in 1948. This period where he was widely left to do what he wanted at the smaller publisher is the first time you begin to see the fully formed artist that Kriegstein would become really letting loose. Despite the fact that this work is criminally overlooked, his output at Hillman during this period easily rivals, if not even overshadows, his much more acclaimed and heralded work for both DC and Marvel Comics. At Hillman, Kriegstein took more and more of an active role in the finished product of his work, becoming involved with as many facets of the production and reproduction of his art as he could. Perhaps as a result, it was during this period that Kriegstein seems to have hit the end of his rope about the quality of his pages as they saw print once the publishers, anchors, and colorists were through with them. After what Kriegstein felt were a series of lackluster and plain lazy inking jobs ruined his meticulously laid out pencils, Kriegstein demanded that he be allowed to ink his own work. Kriegstein was appalled by the fact that Hillman would hire anchors based solely on what he perceived as their ability to finish assignments quickly and not because of any talent, but in actuality a willingness to forego producing quality work and taking pride in it, instead opting for a greater quantity of work in a much shorter time span, allowing for more work and thus more money. The anchors were happy because they got a good payday, and the publishers were happy because everyone was meeting their deadlines. Krigstein, however, could not simply stand idly by, while callous troglodytes obviously defaced his art any longer. Apparently, he became so distressed by the situation that Krigstein threatened to quit if Hillman wouldn't allow him to ink his own pages at one point. Eventually, Hillman relented, and once they did, it was like the floodgates had been opened. Krigstein's stories quickly began to excel, not only in quantity, but in quality as well. He produced a fantastic amount of work for Hillman between 1948 and 52, 26 stories to be precise, and while insanely overlooked, the Hillman stories are also some of his strongest stuff in my opinion, with many distinct trademarks of his work presented for the first time during this integral portion of his career. It was during this time at Hillman and the overlapping work at another publisher, Orbit, that not only was Kriegstein introduced to both romance and horror titles as work on a regular basis for the first time, but that he became acutely aware of and obsessed with something that radically shifted his perception and control of the medium, time. In the sequential movement of one panel and the next, as individual images, and as a page, and even as a story, Krigstein saw infinite possibilities to control time in any conceivable fashion, simply by changing the panel layouts. While he enjoyed movies, in particularly those of the French Nouvelle Vague movement, taking place at the time, Krigstein strongly believed that comics were not movies and should not be thought of as such. In comics, he believed that time could be manipulated and changed in much more drastic and dramatic fashions than had ever been attempted or even envisioned on film throughout the unique object of the comic book panel. Where a script called for a single panel drowning in narrative exposition and dialogue, Krigstein began to imagine a series of what he called staccato panels in its place. These staccato panels are smaller, shorter, acutely sequential panels, usually presented in overlapping or nearly connected images, comprised of more concise shots of actions plural rather than a key action singular as indicated by the script so as to more accurately and engagingly achieve the desired sequential narrative of the story. Kriegstein employed the opposite of the staccato panels as well in landscape oriented panels which also helped Kriegstein manipulate the effects of pacing and action more concisely. He could stretch a single action across multiple panels painfully elongating them, almost seeming to freeze moments in time to torture his characters in nightmarish and inescapable situations. 
he stretched and shrank the panel size, their spatial relationships, their alignment, every conceivable part of the page was under Craigstein's constant scrutiny and at the mercy of his whims at all times and his relentless quest to improve his own craft and elevate the medium to the heights he believed it was capable of. The result was an understanding of the comic book page which had never been achieved before. This desire to toy with panels and layouts became increasingly important to his work until at some point Craigstein became absolutely obsessed with panels. This obsession drove him to the epiphany he had been searching for though. Through his careful examinations of panels on their own, as well as analyzation of the pages and stories they comprised as a whole, Crickstein finally understood a fundamental aspect of the hidden potential of comic books he sought to unlock. The construction and spatial relationship of every component on the page had to work just as well alone as in a group. This is to say that not only did Kriegstein spend as much time and effort laying out a single staccato panel as he did an entire splash page, but that he carefully weighed each image as a separate piece of art, as well as then grouped together for their ability to tell an even larger, all-encompassing piece of visual information to convey a message, in this case a story, all the while also carefully considering the spatial relationships between panels as a way of setting a tempo for the time and allowing the audience room for engagement in the work of the fiction per the quote white space in between panels that we discussed before. It was sheer brilliance literally decades ahead of its time. The problem with that however was one that Crickstein was facing on a more and more regular basis. He was surrounded by people who did not understand what he was trying to do, or perhaps in many cases quite devastatingly just didn't care. For most of Kriegstein's peers, comic books were a business built on a much more standardized system that generated a standardized product and artistic expression was not really a part of the plan for many of them. There was a right way and a wrong way to do things. And the standard way was considered the right one. Though Craigstein had cracked the equation as to how to deal with a great number of many things through his panel layouts, he would be all but forbidden to use them until his work with EC near the end of 1953. As a result of this and a great deal many other things that he found lacking in scripts and layouts, Crickstein began to exert more and more control over the stories that he was working on whenever and however he could get away with it, even when it wasn't necessarily welcomed by anyone else involved. During his time at Hillman, Bernard Crickstein was also working for a company called Orbit. Orbit was an interesting company and a place that would foster Crickstein's considerable talents for a brief but extremely important window of time. Orbit was run by one of the rare and pioneering females in the industry, Ruth Ray Herman. If you think women in the industry are rare today, then you should just look at comic book credits from the golden age. Herman believed that the knowledge she was a woman to people outside of her employee would be so detrimental to the company that she employed the male monikers Ray Herman and Ray Man to trick readers and other publishers into believing that she was in fact a man. Herman herself is an extremely interesting woman actually and at the time Craigstein joined Orbit, Herman was helping found and sitting on the board of directors of the Association of Comics Magazine Publishers. The ACMP was a precursor to the Comics Code whose censorship and persecution of anything they deemed inappropriate would very nearly seal the fate of comics forever a few short years later in 1954 following the Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency. I find this highly ironic considering that Crickstein's masterwork, for lack of a better term, would be created at EC Comics, who bore the unbridled brunt of the public and industry fallout that resulted from the Senate subcommittee hearings as personified at the hands of the CCA. But if you want to learn more about Herman and the ACMP, get in the comment section below, let me know, because tonight we are talking about Bernard Crickstein. Even before he officially worked for Orbit, Ruth Herman took a personal interest in Craigstein and he was reportedly allowed to use their facilities to draw and work on material for 
other companies over a period of several months prior to his employment there. By the time that Kriegstein joined the company in late 1948, Orbit had an established hierarchy. There was definitely someone in charge, and unfortunately for Bernard Kriegstein, it was not Ruth Herman. The head artist and the guy who was really in charge at Orbit was a man named Mort Lev. I know there's going to be a lot of head scratching going on as you try to figure out who that is and why you should care, but the only real reason I could conceive you might possibly know who Mort Lev is would be the fact he created The Heap. The Heap was an early muck swamp monster prototype that played an integral part in both Swamp and Man-Thing's creation and originally showed up in the pages of Airboy Comics. Yeah, like I said, he's not exactly the kind of name that leaps to people's minds these days. While he's relegated mostly to comic obscurity today, at the time Mort Lev was a pretty big deal, especially at Orbit and Kriegstein spent the first year or so of his time there inking Mort Lev's work. Despite the fact most people agree Kriegstein did an amazing job with the inks, Lev did not like Kriegstein and claimed he was unpleased with the job Kriegstein was doing on inking his art. It's unclear if Mort Lev finally insisted that Kriegstein be removed or if Kriegstein just decided he was never going to please Lev and moved on. One of only a handful of individuals that he ever deigned to waste time insulting during an interview, Crickstein would later hilariously refer to Lev as a quote, cold fish in the Stuart Benson interview. As I mentioned, after only about a year, the two ceased working together and Crickstein was rehired by Orbit as a freelance artist. Following his being rehired, Crickstein was allowed freedoms he had never been afforded before and would seldom encounter later in his career either. This creative leeway allowed Bernard Kriegstein to create some of the best work of his entire career, despite the fact that he only did a meager sum of 12 stories for Orbit and all. The Hillman Orbit years from 1948 until 1952 are widely considered among historians to be some of the best work that Kriegstein ever produced, and yet go widely unrecognized apart from hardcore fans and collectors of Kriegstein's work. While his EC stories are obviously considered the best stuff he ever worked on, the Hillman and Orbit work is honestly just about as good in some cases, at least in my opinion, and bear in mind, I love EC comics. There are a few stories of a special note from the Hillman Orbit work. Eugene Vidocq, first great detective from the 1949 issue 8 of Prize Comics Justice Traps the Guilty, is widely considered to be the first really serious story that Crickstein worked on, with many of his trademark storytelling techniques on display in full force for the first time, and his refined mastery of the visual storytelling craft evident from the opening page. Also worth mentioning are Captain Splint's Harry Helper from Airboy Comics No. 4 and Black Silver Heart published in Deadeye Western Comics No. 4, both from 1951. If you're looking for reprints of stuff, Black Silver Heart was such a favorite of Kriegstein's, it was republished under its original and what Kriegstein felt the much more dignified title of Monster of the Seas. This is the title which was discovered inserted on the photostat in his personal collection. The mere fact of Kriegstein having a preferred title and taking the time to reinsert it on his own personal copy, acutely illustrating just how fond of the story he really was. These stories in particular were two of Kriegstein's personal favorites, and in his eyes represented the pinnacle of work that he achieved for Hillman in Orbit. And it's no wonder. Black Silverheart is widely recognized as one of Kriegstein's crowning works, but published a month earlier in May of 1951, Monster of the Seas is one of the best examples of Kriegstein's ability to craft unique and easily identifiable characters, and not merely characters, with a cast of over 100 recognizably different people in a seven-page story. Monster of the Seas is an absolute masterclass in drafting and character design. Despite the quality of the work that he was creating, in 1950, Crickstein realized that he was never going to get anywhere at orbit. Mort Lev did not like Crickstein, and neither did Mort Lawrence, the man just below Lev in the pecking order. 
The Morts, as Kriegstein referred to them, were given all the best assignments, shown all types of preferential treatment, and seeing as they weren't particularly fond of Kriegstein, he decided to start tapering back his workload for Orbit. He had never been pleased with the finished printed version of his art that ended up in people's hands anywhere that he worked, and as I mentioned, Kriegstein had been lobbying to ink his own work for a while at Hillman, even going so far as to threaten to leave the company altogether if he wasn't allowed to start inking his own work. Finally, on the story Now I Can Die Easy from issue 4 of Crime Detective Comics published in 1950, they allowed Krigstein to pencil and ink his own work for the first time. The results spoke for themselves, and from there on, Krigstein quickly negotiated inking all his work for Hillman. Following this agreement to let him start inking his own work at Hillman, Krigstein decided to part ways with Orbit altogether. Presumably sometime during or right around the occurrence of these events, Krigstein received a call that could have potentially rewritten his entire career. Apparently, Harvey Kurtzman was looking to dial back his art duties, thought Krigstein would be a good fit at EC, and offered him a position. This was sometime in the fall of 1951, almost a full three years before Krigstein's first work for the company that would change comic books forever would eventually be published. Unfortunately, as always, Krigstein was in search of the best page rates and turned Kurtzman down, saying in interviews that he still found the stories that he was doing for the other publishers interesting and amusing. His interest in this material would quickly wane, however, as would Krigstein's tolerance for editors making constant demands and revisions to his art. Rather than work for EC in search of the best pay in 1950, Krigstein took a break from comics for nearly four months to work on a proposed newspaper strip, a strip which he came to despise. The man who strove to expand every story he worked on and conceptualized panel layouts completely different than anyone else in the industry did not think well in the limited panel context of a strip. I know that money was fairly tight for Krigstein, and taking almost four months off from comics to work on a strip that did not pan out might have been more than he and his wife could financially manage. This, in fact, may have been Natalie Krigstein's actual impetus to join the comic book industry only months before. That, however, is speculation and supposition on my part and not directly correlated by any quotation or annotation, and I don't know this to be a fact. What I do know is that returning to comics in 1952 with a renewed vigor, after a short hiatus, Bernard Krigstein seemed poised for great things, having only begun to truly tap his vast potential, but instead would set himself on a path that would ultimately prove his career's undoing. Early on in his married life, before entering comics, Krigstein had spent a few months employed at his father's dress factory while struggling to find more permanent employment in the arts. While there, Krigstein had been introduced to an idea which I believe is the true motivating factor for which he was driven from the industry with such vigorous fervor. Carrying the ideas and the principles from his experiences as a menial task laborer back to the comic book industry with him, in 1952, Bernard Krigstein decided that he wanted to form a group to protect comic book illustrators. A kind of society, or union if you will. Once he had a general idea in mind, Krigstein set about trying to recruit other artists to join his proposed group. While I did find a core of industry professionals who agreed to join, the political atmosphere where this was occurring was extremely volatile, and for a number of other reasons, the entire idea was met with a great deal of apprehension and resistance from the onset. First and foremost, many people equated unionization with communism and the whole McCarthyism, Red Era, scare deal that was going on. Not a good thing. The second major obstacle that Krigstein faced were in fact the basic ideas he had come up when founding his little group. Krigstein felt employers should be obligated to finance medical coverage, return original art once it was printed, and that there should be an enforced and uniform minimum page rate for all artists and companies. 
These ideas were an affront to many people who Craigstein approached about joining, especially the top tier artists who had fought to earn the highest page rates and seemingly had nothing to gain but indignation from anyone else being afforded the living wages it had taken them years to achieve. What they failed to understand was that Craigstein's reasoning was actually quite sound and they would have likely benefited from the deal even if only indirectly. If publishers knew they had to pay artists a living wage, they wouldn't be tempted to hire terrible artists that would work quickly and for next to nothing because they didn't care about their work. Publishers would instead have an impetus to actually pay attention to what was inside of their comics and hire the more talented artists, not the cheaper ones. In 1952, this was unheard of and akin to blasphemy, and Crickstein was, by all accounts, openly approaching people with the idea. In doing so, Crickstein had just painted an enormous bullseye on his chest, not just with publishers and editors, but industry professionals of all types, and I don't think he even knew it. In the fall of 1952, Crickstein officially founded the Society of Comic Book Illustrators, along with Arthur Eddy, George Evans, and Ed Ash. Arthur Petty served as vice president under Bernard Crickstein, with Harry Harrison acting as secretary, Larry Warme as treasurer, and Ross Andrew, Ernie Bach, John Celerato, Maury Marcus, and Bernard Sachs all becoming executive board members. I don't have time to go into details about them all here, but there are some pretty heavy hitters on that list, and I'll make sure to include links so you can read up just a little bit on who everyone else involved was, if you'd like, along with those that joined the group proper. There were also people who were essentially social members, who attended meetings and agreed with what the Society of Comic Book Illustrators stood for and was saying, but they didn't necessarily want their names associated or attached to the group for a myriad of reasons. I know that Gil Kane is one of the few people to discuss the Society of Comic Book Illustrators as Gary Groth brought it up when talking to Carmine Infantino at one point during an interview for the Comics Journal. Groth mentions that he talked about it, but neglects to say whether he was a member or not, and though I looked through countless Gil Kane interviews with the Comics Journal, I was never able to ascertain which, if any, published interview Groth is referring to. I've read conflicting accounts of whether Kane was actually a member or not, and while I wasn't able to find any direct quotes or paperwork stating that he was in fact a card-carrying member, as there are so few people who have ever discussed it, I do suspect he was involved, if not in an official capacity, then as a social member of the group at the very least. Unfortunately, as with most collectives, especially run by artists, there were frictions among the group from the very beginning. Even deciding on a name proved a difficult task, devolving into a massive debate requiring a great deal of time to resolve, though this may be for a better reason than most historians would lead you to believe. Evidently, there was a great deal of back and forth about whether they should call themselves the Society of Comic Book Artists with the Society of Comic Book Illustrators. While it might sound like some petty squabbling, Crickstein thought it was essential that they stop referring to themselves as comic book artists, instead preferring the term that the academic world more closely associated with professional artists, illustrators. Crickstein felt that the term illustrator much more accurately conveyed the fact that comic book art was just as valid or important as so-called fine art, and this was important for him. Beyond the Society of Comic Book Illustrators, Crickstein would continue to have this debate with those in and outside of the comic book industry for years. He was extremely passionate about the idea of comic book art and fine art being subjective terms that should not or could not be used to quantify or assign artistic or monetary value. To Kriegstein, there was literally no difference between an incredible work of art created for a comic book and an incredible painting done for an exhibition. They were both incredible and thus equally fantastic in Kriegstein's eyes. 
This distinction was extremely important, not only to Kriegstein, but apparently also to a number of prominent editors and publishers as well, all of whom seemed to take great umbrage at the usage of the term illustrator in relation to comic book artists. And after a great deal of back and forth, it was decided that they would go with illustrator, agreeing with Kriegstein that it implied a more level and equal ground with any and all other forms of professional artistry. This wasn't the only problem that they faced internally though. The other debate which raged for months among the group was whether they would take the form of an actual labor union, organizing strikes and seeking to improve working conditions as Kriegstein believed that they should, or if they should simply try to work as a cohesive unit to promote more of a cooperative and beneficial relationship with the publishers through discussion. In essence, it was the argument whether to mobilize and take action or simply meet and have discussions. The group was torn and this debate was so heated and lasted so long that it was never fully resolved before the society's unofficial abolition. While most of the exceedingly rare accounts that have survived paint the society of comic book illustrators as being completely ineffectual and its members highly disorganized, I have never believed this to be the whole truth. Editors and publishers scrambled to decide how to best combat what I believe they perceived as a very real threat to their quickly expanding and highly profitable market. If they were so ineffectual, this would not have been the case, and publishers certainly would not have gone to lengths of sending moles into the group's meetings to report back about what was happening, which they did. While the group was open to any and all artists in the field, originally no editorial or publishing staff was allowed at society meetings, a fact which likely only helped to further mounting tensions between members and their publishing houses. However, as time progressed and the publishers continued to receive inside reports of what was going on, they could finally no longer sit idly by and they began to lobby to be allowed to attend more and more fervently. DC editor Robert Kaniger was finally allowed to speak at their March 1953 meeting. It would be the beginning of the end for the Society of Comic Book Illustrators and for at least a few of its members as well. Robert Kaniger was famous for his scathing tongue and quick temper and reportedly his speech that night was no exception. Apparently, Kaniger launched into a diatribe condemning the Society of Comic Book Illustrators and everything they stood for, including their name. Kaniger told the collective in no uncertain terms that they were hired guns, that they drew what they were told when they were told for whatever the publishers decided to pay them and that they should be happy about it. They weren't illustrators, and any misconception about a perceived respect of any kind towards them or for their art from publishers, editors, or the readers of the publications in question was a grievous mistake on their part. Kaniger further implied that anyone naive enough to stay with the Society of Comic Book Illustrators might just find it a little bit more difficult to find work. Conversely, though it wasn't explicitly stated, either anyone who forsook the society and prostrated themselves before Kaniger would be rewarded. One such individual was society member and future Spider-Man mainstay, Ross Andrew. Andrew was apparently not only instrumental in getting Kaniger permission to speak that night, but he even helped make contributions to Kaniger's hateful speech. Following Kaniger's haranguing at the March 1953 meeting of the Society of Comic Book Illustrators, Ross Andrew mysteriously subsequently began receiving a great deal more work from Kaniger. Purely a coincidence, I'm sure. To those in attendance, Kaniger's speech was perceived and likely intended as a not-so-subtle threat against anyone foolhardy enough to continue down this path. For months after the speech, Gil came, one of the few people to have ever discussed the Society of Comic Book Illustrators in any sort of detail, as well as Kriegstein himself, claimed Kaniger continued to bully in a submission and poach members until he all but snuffed out the collective before it ever really got a chance to get going. While the Society of Comic Book Illustrators would mail out one final newsletter a few months later, by June of 1953, only a few months following, they were essentially disbanded. Historically, the Society of Comic Book Illustrators has been played up among historians as being completely ineffectual and achieving no real lasting impact. 
there's virtually no mention or coverage of the society anywhere. It's almost as if it never existed. Outside of Kriegstein, you spoke of it a little, and Gil Kane, Harry Harrison, the society's secretary, is the only other person I've ever come across that even mentions the Society of Comic Book Illustrators. And that was only in passing during a single interview. But is the fact that they're portrayed as so useless and their apparent blighting from the records of history really proof of their ineffectiveness? I personally don't think so. If this were true and the society was so incompetent and inconsequential, why did the publishers feel the need to personally intervene so heavy handedly? Why lobby so hard to speak at a meeting? Why have moles in the group reporting back what was happening at the meetings? If there were so few members and they did spend the entirety of their time together bickering about what to call themselves, why would publishers or editors care or even be interested? It definitely had widely reverberating consequences for Krigstein and a few other people who were involved. And in fact, I think that the Society of Comic Book Illustrators quietly being swept under the rug is proof that there were plenty of people that did not want anyone to talk about the society or in fact even remember it even existed. Publishers were in between a rock and a hard place in a lot of ways. The political atmosphere was shifting from the socially conscious programs of the leftist New Deal era to the height of the conservative McCarthyism paranoia and the corresponding witch hunts, many of which specifically targeted the entertainment industry. If comic book editors or publishers publicly spoke out or unsuccessfully tried to squelch the rebellion, they would have invariably drawn unwanted negative attention on the entire industry. This was something no one wanted or needed. They were already under heavy fire and well on their way to the Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency, which would result in the formation of the Comics Code Authority to try and combat public perception and outrage. This inability to take action teamed with the alarming idea of having to actually treat artists like human beings or at least pay them as such and provide basic things like healthcare obviously disgusted and revolted publishers to the point that they savagely undercut the careers of anyone who remained loyal to the society and personally engineered its destruction before it could ever become a fully effective union. While lasting less than a year, I believe that the Society of Comic Book Illustrators was the first big step that Bernard Kriegstein took to being forced out of the industry for good less than 10 years later. Well, that's it for part one. In next week's episode, we'll tackle Kriegstein's move to EC and what many people believe is perhaps the single greatest comic story ever written. But for now, as always, thanks for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did like what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about sharing these videos with your friends. Get in the comments section below and let me know. And if you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you never miss another video or premiere again. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the links in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. For as little as $3 a month, you get access to tons of behind the scenes posts, updates, info, uncut interviews, and even merchandise discount codes and your name in the credits. If you want to support the channel but Patreon is not your thing, have no fear. After two years of fighting with YouTube, you can now finally sign up for membership right here on YouTube. So make sure you check out the different tiers for the perks that fit you best. There's also links to my Ko-Fi page where you can make one-time donations towards specific goals or just tip the channel, and a link to my Amazon page where you can donate source material for research and upcoming episodes, and if that's not enough, there's even links to pick up your very own Jerk Comics shirts like the ones you see on the screen now. I want to sincerely thank each and every single one of you that signed up for the Patreon page, membership here on YouTube, or donated material, money, and or 
your equipment. I can't tell you all how much I appreciate it. It really means the world to me, and I couldn't do these episodes without your help. Speaking of which, this episode was brought to you by the Jerk Broadcasting System, as well as generous grants from the viewers that you see on the screen now. I'd also like to thank my loyal Wednesday warriors, Mike Dolan, John Utley, David Arroyo, Super Chasen, and Mike Dolan again, as well as Weapon X Qual, David Arroyo, John Havarton, Thomas N. Perkins, and Alex Gaylor for their generous donations once again. You guys are amazing, and I don't know what to say other than thank you. And speaking of which, thank you for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. Either way, as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops, and keep reading comics.